a documentary on Hamilton County during the year 1812. Narrated by Aaron Weaver. The communities within the Adirondack Park's Blue Line all have a unique history of their own. Each town and village develops their own culture through trials, challenges, and the environment around them. All communities in the Adirondacks have much in common because of the mountains, and yet they are diverse because of them. The town of Lake Pleasant is no exception. As you understand the history of this isolated town, surrounded and entwined by wilderness, you will learn of a constant struggle of keeping up with the American progress while living in harmony with its natural surroundings. A town that wants to be proud as Americans, but wants to be left alone. It can be hard to translate this phenomenon into the minds of those who live outside the Adirondack Park. The best way to help you understand the people of Lake Pleasant is by telling you their history. After the American Revolution, the northern and northwestern frontier of New York State was open for settlements. The place that we now call Lake Pleasant and Speculator was once part of the town of Wells in Montgomery County. The town of Wells covered most of what is now Hamilton County. It was impossible for the head of this town located around the now existence of Lake Algonquin Reservoir to oversee the other communities being formed up north. The mountains, wild forests, and rugged roads made it almost impossible to govern the town as a whole. In 1812, Montgomery County saw fit to grant the settlers around the lake, Lake Pleasant, their own town. This made it easier for the town of Wells to govern themselves and to allow the new town, Lake Pleasant, to form their own community. However, just as Wells had trouble governing their northern territory, so did Lake Pleasant have trouble governing their northern settlements. Soon, those settlements would become towns of their own and within the town of Lake Pleasant, a village would be created. Thursday, April 7th, 1812. This day was Lake Pleasant's first town meeting. The town meeting was located in a more humble setting at the home of Joshua Rich. The location of his house was at the outlet of Round Lake, now known as Sakandaga Lake on Lake Pleasant's shore. Rich's house was chosen because of the location. A good number of settlers lived near there and passed by foot, wagon, or water all met at this spot. Rather by foot, ox cart, canoe, or boat, all who attended this meeting could travel there by their own means. Because of this location, Joshua and his wife Anna would house travelers throughout the years. The first innkeeper, George Wright, of Lake Pleasant, was elected the first town supervisor. Wright moved from the town of Kanajawaga, Montgomery County. Wright's Inn was located south of Lake Pleasant's inlet. William Burke Peck was elected first town clerk. William Peck moved to Lake Pleasant in 1811 with his father, Loring Peck. Loring Peck was a captain in a few Rhode Island regiments of the Continental Army during the American Revolution. After the war, 
Loring Peck became a lieutenant colonel of Bristow and Tiverton, Rhode Island Regiment. By 1811, Colonel Loring and William Peck bought the home of Ebenezer and Amos Green in Lake Pleasant. There, they started a farm with their wives Sarah and Elizabeth. Ebenezer Dunham, Joshua Rich, and Ephraim Page were elected assessors. George Wright, George Peck, also son of a little Colonel Loring Peck, and Amos Green were elected to build roads. John Dunham was named collector and constable. Plus, Ether Barnes was named constable. Josiah Rich and Joseph Davis were elected overseers of the poor. The town of Lake Pleasant's biggest concern at the time was livestock getting loose from the residents' properties. The main livelihood at the time was in livestock and lumber. Caleb Nichols and Colonel Loring Peck were named fence viewers to help build fences around the community's private properties to contain livestock. Daniel Fish and William Peck were named pound masters, or what we would call today pound catchers. This problem of loose livestock also brought about Lake Pleasant's first law. Swine should not be allowed or permitted to feed or run at large unless they adjudged by fence viewers. Again, it was resolved that any ram or rams that may be found off of or from the enclosure of its owner at any time between the first day of September and the first day of December in any year shall be forfeited from and belong to the persons apprehending and taking up the same. As supervisor, George Wright took his seat with the Board of Supervisors of Montgomery County, which on October 6, 1812, was at the county seat in Johnstown. The town of Lake Pleasant had 159 taxpayers. The value of real estate was $138,232. County tax was $39. Town tax was $38.84, and $200 was for roads and bridges. There were no school taxes until the year 1815. Lake Pleasant would not allow their children to be educated for over three years. The reason for this setback was because it was too dangerous for the local residents to send their young ones to school. You would think that Lake Pleasant was and always has been a quiet town. However, 1812 proved to be a year that the first settlers would never forget. The United States of America declared war with the British Empire on June 18, 1812. With the Empire busy dealing with Napoleon Bonaparte in Europe, the United States believed they found a way to take Canada and save her from imperial hands. This, however, was a mistake. Canada did not want rescuing and were very loyal to her motherland. The War of 1812 between Canada and the United States would last over two years. At the beginning of the War of 1812, Canada could not rely on the British Empire to protect her from the United States. As such, they turned to other allies, the Native American tribes. About 35 tribes under the leadership of a Shawnee war chief, Takamsa, meaning shooting star, and his brother Tenskwatawa, the Shawnee prophet, allied with the British Empire, they called themselves the First Nations. The First Nations agreed with the British Empire to help prevent USA's expansion west of the Appalachian Mountains. 
This was a concern to many American frontier towns near the Canadian border. The First Nation, along with Canadian militias, attacked successfully in Wisconsin and the Upper Great Lakes. Even though Lake Pleasant wasn't as near to the Canadian border as many towns who did battle with the First Nation, this didn't mean that they were safe from any attack. Native Americans were no stranger to the town of Lake Pleasant. The settlers were living in Mohawk hunting grounds, and the townsfolks were quite comfortable having Native Americans as neighbors. Intermarriage between Native Americans and the settlers was not uncommon. One particular neighbor was a Mohawk named Captain Gill. Captain Gill was one of the first guides in the Adirondacks after the American Revolution. He and his people hunted in these mountains way before the first European settlers came. By the time Lake Pleasant became a town, Captain Gill was living in a wigwam at the outlet of Lake Pleasant. He had a wife, Molly, and a daughter, Molly Jr whom he made clear wasn't his own child. After the United States declared war on the British Empire, there were sightings of Native Americans from Canada hunting and fishing in the forest of Lake Pleasant. The townsfolks were full of terror, and all but the Peck family left for southern Montgomery County or other neighboring counties. Many families from the town of Wells fled in fear. Because of this, the future of Wells and Lake Pleasant was in great peril. An application was then written by the remaining families in Wells and Lake Pleasant. This application was in order to raise a company of volunteers to create guards for the town of Wells and Lake Pleasant. By doing so, this will bring courage back into the communities, defend the citizens from a massacre, and encourage families to return home. William Peck of Lake Pleasant, John Francisco of Wells, and possibly a few other men left their unguarded homes to deliver the application to Albany. In Albany, the governor of New York, Daniel D. Tompkins, who later became the sixth vice president of the United States under James Monroe, received the application. Tompkins then filed the Second Amendment to U.S. Constitution, which states, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. In doing so, Governor Tompkins commissioned William Peck as captain and John Francisco as lieutenant of the Wells and Lake Pleasant Home Guards. Governor Tompkins placed the Home Guard militia under Company C of Montgomery County's 122nd Regiment. At the time, James Ford was lieutenant colonel of this regiment. Governor Tompkins then provided muskets, ammunition, and whatever else was needed for the militia. However, all this must be returned to Albany after the war ended. The most popular musket that was given to soldiers during the War of 1812 was the 1795 Springfield musket. Those in the Wells and Lake Pleasant Home Guards who did not own a rifle or a musket may have been provided one of these. The 1795 Springfield musket has a 69 caliber and a 44 3 4th inch long round barrel. The musket itself is 16 inches in length and weighs around 10 pounds. Once the volunteers were recruited into the Home Guard militia, they then had to learn the art of war. The militia had their own musicians. Gardner, Odell, a farmer in Wells, played the drums, 
while Jesse Whitman, also a farmer in Wells, played the fife. Those who carried the muskets were John M. Craig, Henry Overacre, Joel Vanderhoof, Henry Vanderhoof, John Vanderhoof, John Sisko, John Beagle, James Beagle, Asher Osborne, Peter Beagle, Michael Overacre, John Arnold, Thomas Turner, Rose Turner, David Winna, Michael Sisko, Giles Vanderhoof, Gilbert Vanderhoof, John Smith, James Snow, Joe Sweat, Samuel Pickett, George Spaulding, Henry Walker, John Dunham, Richard Peck, John M. Craig, and David Winna. In 1814, Captain William Peck became Lake Pleasant's town supervisor. As such, John Francisco became captain. Cornelis Francisco became lieutenant. Joshua Wadsworth became ensign. And Gilbert Vanderhoof became first captain. There was one man from the town of Lake Pleasant who joined to fight in the War of 1812. Daniel Fish and his wife Susanna Fish moved from Rhode Island to Lake Pleasant, New York in 1801. They had a farm on Fish Inlet, which is now Cherry Brook. When the war broke out, Daniel Fish joined the 23rd Regiment of the United States Infantry. The 23rd Regiment fought in many battles along the St. Lawrence River and other parts of the Canadian border. From August 4th through September 21st, 1814, the United States sieged Fort Erie. During one of the battles, Daniel Fish was killed. Possibly the last time he saw Lake Pleasant was if the 23rd Regiment marched through town along the military road. Because there was mostly wilderness between Albany, New York, and the Canadian border, roads needed to be built to transport supplies and men. On June 19, 1812, just a day after the war was declared, an act for opening and making a road between the city of Albany and the River St. Lawrence was passed. A military road passed through the Totten and St. Lawrence Turnpike at Russell, where there was an armory. Perkins Clearing was part of the Totten and Crossfield Purchase at the time. After the War of 1812, the town folks of Lake Pleasant tried to begin their lives anew. Captain William Peck started the town's first general store. Two log schoolhouses were built roads were repaired. The local Native Americans and settlers tolerated and respected each other. A promising future was in reach and the quiet years began. Mm -hmm.